am Jacob Heilbrunn, back again with a new edition of In the National Interest with our executive editor, Harry Kazianis, who has been with the National Interest for many years. Harry, Ronna McDaniel just stepped down as head of the Republican National Committee. Why and what does it mean? <laughs> well, it's good to be with you, Jacob, and good to good to talk politics. Look, I I'm not surprised that that Ronna McDaniel is is, is going to be leaving. And in fact, I'll be quite blunt. I, I thought she should have been fired a long time ago. I mean, not not to say that I'm some sort of big MAGA supporter. I'm 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 sympathetic to a lot of populist Republican ideas. But look, let's be honest. Ronna McDaniel's is not a good fit for that position when the modern Republican Party of 2024 is a populist MAGA party. You know, I, I honestly I get in fury when people start calling the Republican a conservative party. I mean, it has a lot of conservative thoughts, ideas, trends, decision makers, policymakers. But at its core, that the new base of the GOP that's been dominant since 2016 is is MAGA, which is populist, which is rural grassroots activists, evangelicals. Um, and look, let's face it, Ronna McDaniels is not that person, e- even though she's one of these Republicans who tries to to mold and shape herself into, you know, a MAGA populist. L- look, let's just be honest. She, she's she's not that person. And this is why, you know, if, if you track, you know, you know, populist or MAGA podcasts and alternative media, you know, the, the grassroots of, of today's GOP, they hate her guts. And it's, it's easy to see why that she's going to be taking a hike pretty soon. Harry, you're correct that there has been a deep aversion to Ronald McDaniel on the far right of the Republican Party. But I want to question your assertion that the Republican Party is a MAGA party. Nikki Haley scored 40 percent in South Carolina. Matt Drudge this morning says that the real story is that the GOP is a house divided and will be unable to win over the suburban and independent voters that it desperately needs in 2024. Is that true? It's not entirely wrong. I mean, look, if you look at South Carolina, I, I haven't broken down the polling data yet, but, it, you know, from from what I've read and what I've seen right up to the to the votes is that as long as you hadn't voted in the Democratic primary, you were able to vote in the Republican primary. So I'd be curious to see how many independents and others crossed over to give Nikki Haley those votes. And look, in a straight election, if, if this was let's say 2008, 2012, maybe even 2014, and we were having this discussion, Nikki Haley would look really great against Joe Biden. I mean, there's there's no doubt about it. But I, I think we have to really take stock of the fact of how much the GOP has changed. I mean, I've, I've seen it personally, Jacob, as you recall, for, for a little while, I, I worked at the Heritage Foundation, and I I was there during 2015 and 2016, and really watched the transformation of that organization from being a, a pro Ronald Reagan, pro trade, you know, your classic GOP, your Mitt Romney GOP, if you will, and with within eight to nine months, that organization completely flipped from having, you know, a, a little bit of a, a mild allergy to Donald Trump and some of the things he said and done and did in his background and, you know, affairs with women. I mean, stuff you can't even make up um, to, to being full throated supporters of Donald Trump to this day. I mean, the, the Heritage Foundation has been, been completely taken over by by the, the MAGA ethos and in MAGA ideology, if you will. So to, to just be honest with you, it's it. A, a mod, there is space for a, a, a moderate conservative like a Nikki Haley, a Mitt Romney, a, a Liz Cheney, but just not in the modern GOP today. I mean, I, I don't even like calling the Republican Party the, the grand old party because it's not that party anymore. You know, it is it is fundamentally changed. And I, and I think the fun question, and we should talk about this at length in another podcast, is, you know, what happens to the GOP after Donald Trump? I mean, let's say Donald Trump does win the, the you know, the, the 2024 election. I mean, he's a lame duck. He's going to have really two years of productivity. And then after that, you know, once we get to the midterms, everybody's going to be asking, well, who takes over for Donald Trump? You know, that's why there's all these questions about who's going to be his VP. So anyway, we can go down the rabbit hole pretty far in all this. But the, the bottom line is, is yes, Nikki Haley did decently well, but She's never going to win the GOP nomination. It's it's done. She needs to quit. She needs to move on or she needs to become a third party candidate. There was a good story in The Washington Post this morning called Russia Looms Over Yet Another Trump Presidential Campaign, that Trump's fresh praise of Moscow, his refusal to condemn Putin, 
he uh, will not discuss the assassination or murder of Alexei Navalny, who died in a Russian penal colony. And in a Fox News town hall on Tuesday night, he praised Russia for being, quote, a war machine, unquote. What do you think explains the bromance with Russia and specifically with Vladimir Putin? <laughs> you know, I, I can't explain it, to be honest with you, Jacob. I, I think it's bad news for, for, for Donald Trump and the GOP. I mean, let's face it. Vladimir Putin is a is a is a thug. He's a dictator. He's a totalitarian. He has blood in his hands. You know, I can I can put any negative connotation to that man that and they would all fit. They would all absolutely fit. You know, if I had to 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 think on in Donald Trump sort of lane, I think he thinks he's going to be president of the United States in the next couple months. And I think he's trying to to do what he always tries to do, what he do try to do to Kim Jong Un, what he tried to do to Xi Jinping when he was in office. And let's try to sweet talk these dictators to try to think that, you know, he he can sort of negotiate with them and sort of his own version of you know, Nixonian real politique, but with a a Trump sort of spin to it. I mean, that's that's my take of what he tried to do in office. You know, was that successful? What did that create, you know, a better geopolitical position for the United States? On North Korea, I'd say it would. The North Koreans didn't test ICBMs or, or nuclear weapons during Trump's time in office. That definitely slowed the growth of their nuclear and missile programs. I mean, when it came to Russia, I mean, you know, take the rhetoric and put the rhetoric aside. He he slapped san sanctions on Russia. You know, he he was very tough. He gave arms to Ukraine. Maybe not a lot of arms, but certainly a lot more arms than Barack Obama. Uh, when it came to China, you know, he did something that a lot of populists in, in the MAGA movement wanted him to do from Peter Navarro to Steve Bannon to, to so many others. And that's go into a trade war with the Chinese and try to damage their economy. And at least the theory goes in MAGA land, stop them from being the number one geopolitical foe the United States will face in the decades to come. And you know, try to hurt them as badly as they can. You know, we you know, you can argue these things all day long, but that's sort of I think what Trump was trying to do, but keep in mind, Trump can flip on a dime. You know, if you if you go back to the, especially the North Korea example, which is the one I've, I have the most expertise on, you know, when North Korea started flinging ICBMs in the sky and, and long range missiles back and right before Trump became president, he got very angry. You know, that bromance stuff didn't start until, you know, he felt like he pushed back on the North Koreans enough. So we'll have to see where this all goes. But that's 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 my version of trying to get into Trump's head, if you will. Final question, Harry. As Trump rolls to the Republican nomination, speculation is mounting about who he will choose to become his vice president. And he seems to be another casting call as on The Apprentice, as various figures ranging from Tim Scott to Elise Stefanik vie for his nod. Do you have any special insights to convey to us? I mean, I've, I have I will be honest, I have talked on background with a lot of GOP insiders, RNC members, people close to the, the Trump orbit and, and, and Vivek's orbit and, and a lot of these other people's orbits. Putting it all together, I can I can tell you sort of what my consensus viewpoint, at least for me, is it has to be somebody that is a diehard MAGA populist supporter and not one of these converts. And what I mean by that is not somebody who's sort of jumping on the, the Trump bandwagon, you know, like a Mike Pence or, or somebody else, you know, somebody who's been with him right along or has sort of grew up in Republican politics during this this MAGA moment, if you will. Uh, that rules out Elise Stefanik. I mean, if you go back and, and look at Elise Stefanik's record, you know, you know, before Trump got the nomination in 2016 and leading up to that, she's a convert. She didn't like Trump. She was she was much more in the the Nikki Haley, Liz Cheney camp of the GOP. She was much more moderate. She was not MAGA. She's a she's one of these people in the GOP who sort of tried to shape shift her way into becoming a populist. You know, simple Google search will will break that down pretty quickly. Um you know, there there are others, you know, Tim Scott, for example, I, I think Tim Scott is an incredibly nice, generous Christian human being, um, but that doesn't make him MAGA. I mean, he's he is another sort of one of these MAGA converts. I mean, if you listen to some of his ideas on foreign policy, on Iran, on Russia, he does not fit the MAGA ethos of, of, of you know, a, a, you know, a, a, a spirited, you know, militaristic foreign policy that, you know, MAGA does, does not like. So who's left? I, I think that only leaves a, a couple people. I think that leaves Vivek. I think Right now, if I had to make a guess, I think that would be probably his top choice. I mean, I think Vivek is is more MAGA and populist than than Trump, to be honest with you. So I think he would be certainly a top choice. 
Ron DeSantis could be a sleeper choice. I know a lot of people say that's impossible. You know, there's constitutional questions. A lot of people forget that Ron DeSantis and Donald Trump, according to the Constitution or many people's interpretation of the Constitution, cannot be on the same ticket. So, you know, does Ron DeSantis resign as governor and move to D.C. or Georgia or something? I don't know. But, you know, Ron DeSantis Trump ticket would be very powerful. I I guess the bottom line, Jacob, you got to frame it up this way. Who is the person that can retain the tens of millions of people who have come in the Republican Party since 2016 when Donald Trump originally won the White House? That's the number one criteria for Donald Trump. If he wants to to have some sort of long lasting legacy in Republican politics and to really cement that that mega populist legacy on the GOP, if that's the number one criteria, you're talking Vivek, you're talking, you know, Ron DeSantis, you know, I I don't, I don't see any of these like neocon rehashes being part of the conversation because as soon as Donald Trump is, is, you know, if they were to win the white house in, you know, 2028, they're going to cast aside all that MAGA ideology. Plus would they really vote in, in a primary for some of these people like a Tim Scott or, or some others? I don't, I don't think so. I don't think they want to have their Nikki Haley moment. So that's my thinking. There you have it from Harry J. Cassianis, quote, no neocon rehash, unquote. Until next time, I'm Jacob Halvren, and thanks for listening to In the National Interest. Thanks, Jacob.